let people come in. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, to this intellectual shamans conversation uh, between Sandra Waddock and um, Rob Van Tolder as well. We're thrilled to see you. Happy end of April. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra very, very shortly. First, we have Michael here from the International Humanistic Management Association um, to, to welcome you all as well. Welcome. Well, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Sandra, for doing this. Thank you, Rob, for joining. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This is uh, my name is Mike Pearson. I'm leading the International Humanistic Management Association. We're, we're hoping to inspire with these conversations and, and support. Um, I will put in the chat a conference where some of you have already committed to being there so that we can support one another even more because what we're talking about here is central, I believe, to many of the problems that we're that we have to address. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for being here over Sandra. Uh, Erica. <laughs> I, I don't need to say anything else other than to, and Sandra needs no introduction as this is really the series that she's been um, facilitating for, for many years now. Uh, but Sandra, would you? Sure. Like to yeah. So, um, so this is a welcome. Well, I'd like to welcome Rob Van Tuller to our Intellectual Shamans uh, webinar series. Um, and I'll introduce him in just a minute. But first, I want to say we will what, what the format is that Rob will present his, some of his background and work for about uh, 25 minutes to half an hour. And then I'll ask him a few questions. And then we'll be turning the questions over to the audience, to you, for you to engage with Rob directly and ask him any questions that you might have. So uh, Rob, I've known Rob for a long time at this point, I think. Um, Rob is full professor of, the, of International Business and Society Management at Rotterdam School of Management uh, at Erasmus University and academic director and founder of the Partnerships Resource Center. Um, he's one of the leading figures behind the cross-sector social interaction scholarly movement. He's co-founder and department chair of Business Society Management and one of the leading departments in the world that organizes research and education on the way business can create value for society, either alone or through cross-sector social partnerships. He advises international organizations, governments, mul multinationals, and international NGOs on issues of sustainability and strategy. And I just, I don't know if you can be able to see this massive tone. Ah, you have it. <laughs> <laughs> he has just recently published an enormous book. It's like, I don't know, a thousand pages long. Yeah. Um, called Principles of Sustainable Business, Frameworks for Corporate Action on the SDGs. Um, and um, it's an amazing work of scholarship. And I just want to, I'm so thrilled that Rob can be with us today. So Rob, I, with that, I'll turn it over to you. And Erica's putting some um, um, notes about how this works and some links to various activities into the chat. So please, and please add your questions and we'll get to them as... Um, uh, uh, not quite in order, but more or less in order afterwards. Okay, Rob, it's all up to well, you. Thanks, uh, Sandra, for setting this up and setting me up also. We had this conversation, I remember, in August with the Academy of Management in Boston. And then uh, I had to sort of postpone my participation here because I actually wanted me already in November or October. or And that, so I'm really happy that it materializes now, end of April. Uh, hopefully not too late uh, to share a number of my ideas. So, and I'm really pleased also to get some floor to present some of the stuff that that are developed. Of course, it will be a selection. So let me share my screen with you and and then show you some of the slides that I prepared. Of course, they they will be they will be uh, uh, provided to to Ima uh, if you need it. Um, so I, I wrote a little summary also, and I hope you saw that already, but the, the title that I, I wanted to, to deal with is uh, Facing a Cascade of Crisis. So that's the pleasant challenge we all face as educators, as students, as executives, as societies. But I want to introduce this term called education of the heart. Uh, we are, this is an intellectual shaman meeting. It's about human uh, management issues, uh, humanistic management association that really inspires me also to do something that I normally not always do, talk about the heart and about passion and about motivation. 
but I think it is it is important to do that. So let let I hope I can I can draw you into this picture. And I always start with this. This is what we call the Fuka world, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world we all live in. So that's a sort of neutral term. And of course, the question is what to deal with that. This is the, the text that you all received. So it, it basically says we are facing a plethora of challenges. It is a problem of how to educate present generations uh, also to make it more challenged and principle-based and then to see what to do with intelligence. And I introduced four types of intelligence. I call that rational, emotional, practical, and societal intelligence. And already you can see that it's not just a big book that sounded I'm really happy that you showed it. And also because there's a website and the tools and teachers. So it's not just something we developed as an intellectual thing. It's actually we, we developed also to give it heart, a heart, hands, and, and purpose. So maybe we can, we can come back to that later on. So the leading question of my talk is basically this. And I want to also look at how students and academics at the same time, so that's why it's important that they can be stimulated, coached, and can be empowered to effectively and constructively deal with the grand development challenges of today. So this is something, because every time that I do something like this, people say, well, we have to specialize in, in, in one area or in another area, and complexity is too big anyway, so uh, let's not do this. Certainly at the business school, that's a problem. But for me, then the question is what educational and organizational strategies, so I'll call it the unit of analysis, can be adopted without simplifying or denying society's systemic challenges. I'll call it the level of analysis. And again, here we have some basic fundamental insights, and I put a lot more in that big book. But also, I will introduce to you what I call the skill sheets formula, which I developed earlier than this big book on, on sustainable business, but actually it neatly follows some of the basic principles of the way I do research, teach, but also engage and advise uh, also big companies and policymakers and the like. And of course, then the question is, how can universities, and you can see, regain relevance, legitimacy, and impact in this increasingly FUCA world? And maybe you already see, I'm extremely critical about the role of universities and educational institutes. I think we are losing legitimacy and relevance, and maybe we can have a discussion. I will not deal with that in any detail, but that you know by now that I'm very critical about this, but always try to not to just criticize it from a distance and I basically say, uh, we go our own way, but try to engage inside of the organization to deal with that. How do I want to do that? I have five points in the half, say the 28 minutes that are left for me at the moment. Just one slide on the Poli crisis. What is the generic challenge? And also the statement there is, you cannot separate one from the other. That means also how to deal with that in personal skill development. We call that the 21st century skills. Then what I call the pedagogy of flow. And that is more the, the education of the heart philosophy, how to engage in effective learning. I relate that to some traditional learning theory, but I basically say, how can we get out of this learning as sort of the, how do you call that, say that, uh, the discomfort zone uh, thing, and then see how you can also make use of, of also the inspirational side of the big challenges. Make it more purposeful. I introduce a word like triangulation, but I use a specific in a specific way. And then the last part, and then we'll see how much time I still have, is what I would call creating the organizational conditions. And you can see to the left, the big book that Sandra introduced, but the second book, which has also has a website and tools, uh, call it the skill, this, the skill sheets, and maybe what we also did, what I call the RSM model. So how we try to implement it at the university level. So let me get th quickly through the first two points. For in a way, I, I hope it re you recognize this. We, we live in what we call a FUCA world, which means we have crisis. This is what you can call poli crisis. And without further sort of explaining that, I call them man-made, including the climate crisis, but of course the refugee, the, 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 the health crisis, the biodiversity crisis up to even worse, uh, to a large extent, they are neatly combined with what I call then the last 25 years of the globalization gone wrong in, in a way. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the, also the background of what we studied over the last 25 years. Summarizing it in a way that the World Economic Forum does, it's say, well, we can look at each of these and pick them out, study them, 
but they're interconnected. So it, we need holistic approaches in order to identify what is there. Uh, and you can see already that climate action to a certain extent has been, of course, adopted by our students as, as one of the biggest challenges. But actually, if you go into the root cause of climate crisis, the cost of living crisis is even much more prevailing. Also, if people don't earn a decent wage, a decent living, they will not be able and even willing to engage in the bigger issues. Of course, this is what you call a polar crisis or a cascade of crisis, the UN calls it. And the last 25 years, we went from a, a hegemonic position of the US to, at best, you can say, a multipolar world, but maybe a hegemonic fight between the US and China. And if you like, I'm a political economist, so this is one of my favorite topics, but I'm not going to lecture about that today. But this is just one slide on the, the nature of the crisis. So the personal skill development challenge, my second part of the story is, well, what does it mean? And then again, I go back to, to the World Economic Forum. They do this sort of every four years uh, sort of assessment of the kind of skill development challenge that are faced. And I'm always very intrigued by what they do because you can see this over a, a period of 10 years. They identify not ICT or, or instrumental skills, but actually complex sol problem solving people management, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, a complex uh, active learning and learning strategies, innovation, creativity, resilience, stress tolerance, uh, and a little bit technology design and programming. And you can see a negotiation. So what I would normally would say, if the World Economic Forum identified this as sort of, if you what are the skills that you need for a job or for a career or whatever, then we might seriously start thinking about what the challenges that we face also educational institutes and how can we then for instance engage for instance in complex problem and I, they call it complex problem solving i'm i'm into the wicked problems theory very much so complex problems approaching dealing with great solving that's another issue but hopefully we have some time maybe to talk about that because actually in making the distinction between we're not we don't have solutions necessarily but we have approaches way to deal with that the road going the road is more important than finding the the ultimate goal or finding a solution so these are my first two parts of the presentation uh, so then the question is if you are going to include that in teaching i developed this what i call the education of the heart by the way this is not my term it's a term introduced by the dalai lama a long time ago with this team talking about passion, about following your heart, but of course, education of the heart means uh, that you understand what your passion is, that you not only see that as a static ident identity, but you can develop it further. So then the question is how to develop that. And I call that the pedagogy of flow, or as some other would say, challenge-based learning. Now, very simple model. I hope you can see the traditional view of learning. It's about competencies, low, high, and awareness, low, high. Very traditional, I, and I started to do it like this, also showing learning cycles in terms of, well, you have no competencies, but you're not aware of that. So you're unaware incompetence. That's what children are, at least I hope. Uh, not scientists, of course, but you could, you could become aware incompetent. And of course, if you go further, then you will say, this is the discomfort zone. You start to become confronted with what you are aware of that you are incompetent in some areas. But actually, people would say in learning theory, that's when you learn. Um, uh, and of course, that is nice. And if you do it even better, then you become aware competent. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, no, no gain, no pain, no gain. Um, a very instrumental way of, of, of learning, by the way. Uh, and if you do that well, that's learning theory. That You can also say, well, after that, you go down. So you become unaware competent. That might be nice, say, if you want to drive a car so that you don't have to think of how to use the gearbox or whatever. But from a learning point of view, and certainly when we have a challenge-based learning, I think this is the ultimate thing. When you become aware competent at a higher level, you go in a second phase and the third phase, and then to address other issues that you, uh, you still find in important, certainly in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Now what happens in reality? This is of course learning theory. So my experience is this. 
we get a calculating response to learning. We get students that are confronted with this uh, uh, discomfort zone and they go for what are the six minus, calculate or the C minus, I would say in the, in the, in the, in the US uh, structure. Say you calculate, you try to limit your, not only your ambition and your involvement, but you go for the lowest rate or lowest common denominator. So that actually means that you become semi-aware incompetent, which is better, of course, that you're fully aware of your incompetence. So you limit this. Uh, this might be the snowflakes generation or whatever you want to call it. I call it calculating students. Unfortunately, that's the analysis that I made also in my own institute. Calculating students lead to calculating teachers or calculating administrators So and control. And everybody's controlling everybody else. And in the end, we are sort of getting up with what we actually achieved, a university that is a sort of learning factory that that has great difficulties also in applying more complexity oriented uh, learning. The flow approach, on the other hand, does it something different that looks at the discomfort zone as something that we would call a flow. So the question is, how are you getting through the discomfort zone? And you can do that by control, by learning, by grading, by well, uh, I don't know, uh, exams. But you can also do that by stimulating, by making people aware of things that they like. So this is what we call the, the discomfort zone in a flow. It also means that what is the challenge if you can sort of get rid of the distractions, personal problems, failure, weather conditions, whatever. So then the flow dimension, and that is the the the, the idea behind also a, a positive way of learning, is that you want to do something that you find challenging, but not too, but that you are passionate about. So not something that is theoretical, but actually something, but it can be theoretical, but nevertheless, is very close to your heart. So this is the first thing that we developed. And this is not something I developed in, in a year. Actually, I started to have three versions of the Skillsheets book based on the discomfort zone and congratulating my students that they felt very uneasy, but I said, congratulations, you're learning. And then suddenly I started to realize that, well, if I'm doing this in a, in a normative way, I'm the teacher, the expert, and I learn people to do a number of tricks, that is not the, the, the best way to educate people, but actually it's also not the nice way to teach and to, to be a, an educator. So this was the challenge, how to get people in the flow. So what defines the flow? That's the education of the heart. Work on a challenging topic that requires your attention on the basis of intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is close to your heart, what you make feel motivated about, but also keeps you away from distractions. You, uh, you will see you work on something, it's difficult, but you work on that for 10 hours or two weeks or whatever in a row. And you get not distracted, it's relatively easy to be disciplined, and actually, I talked to that with my colleagues because I have a number of colleagues at the Rasmus University on happiness research. This type of flow and this experience is the essence of happiness. It's not that you achieve something, but that you do something in a, in a flow. Now, making that more objective, the challenging topic is what you might call an intellectual challenge, your head, your heart is your passion, your motivation. Uh, uh, and of course, you need to develop that, write about that, do research, work together. So that's your, your hands. So you can see already that the, the, the cover of the third edition of the skill sheets explicitly then refers to heart, head, and hands. And in the terms of a, a book, but you can also see with a growing number of, of skills at, at various levels of, of mastery. So that's the, the, the third part of my, my little speech taking at least one element of this education out the heart from also my own experience that that's reiterating uh, uh, learning as a serious thing that takes a lot of pain and time and no pain, no gain. Actually, yes, but there has to be something else. So then we have the second challenge. I call that navigating intelligence. And I use the triangulation and you can see already this is the Escher triangle. So there is something strange with this triangle. It, it doesn't exist. Uh, 
but it, it sort of gives you the idea, I call that paradoxical learning, by the way, from a theoretical point of view, but now focus on the education of the heart principle, what we develop, what, what we call the activation trinity. And you maybe you know about the activation trinity. Actually, the question is always how to combine head, heart, and hands. Of course, in my previous point, I already made it clear, do something that is challenging or whatever. Do something that you like, do something that you feel motivated about and that you can be disciplined. So in a way, that's the activation trinity challenge that we see. I, as an economist, for instance, I learned from a macroeconomist, it's very important to be rational, to, to quant quantify whatever, but please also uh, uh, look at issues of poverty and, and what motivates you. But as an add-on, not as an integral part of this. So just to summarize the argument that we do now here, what, what they call how to activate the activation trinity is to look at the different types of intelligence. So your rational intelligence can be your IQ, your passion uh, can be your emotional intelligence, and your practical intelligence are how you use your hands. So then the question is, is it possible in a teaching environment or in any type of coaching environment to combine the three? And I, I write long papers on this, and I hopefully to see what we did also on campus, how to combine this. But the most important part is to give purpose to this. So the, the, the outcome of this activation trinity or dilemma is you need to do something with your intelligence that is not just rational, emotional, or practical. So that's where I introduce societal intelligence. What is your social what are the challenges that you face? And I hope you don't mind for the moment for me, these are the big challenges, the wicked problems that we face at the sustainable development goals. Uh, that's where the big book was about. But you can now already see that I linked the skills formulation and development with the content also, because that is one of the most important part of the, what I call the activation triangle or called the synthesis challenge. The principle of education of the heart is always try to strive for a synthesis between head, heart, and hands by making it purposeful and linked to real challenges. Not, uh, uh, for instance, I've been teaching in the past uh, presentation skills, for instance, and I say, okay, uh, do a presentation on your holiday or whatever, uh, but in an edu in educational, uh, and then learn how to do your posture and to do gestures or not which is very instrumental, very functional. I did that for a long time. But then at a certain moment, I changed that into, okay, what do you feel passionate about? Maybe the holiday, by the way, but say climate change or poverty or with students, loneliness or Israel, of course. Uh, so then the presentation and the feedback on the presentation becomes something completely different. By the way, it's not about ideology or whatever. It's about presentation skills then. Of course, then how to convey a message and how to build it up on the basis of really intelligence. So the intelligence part of the many of the present uh, 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 sort of conflicts in society are partly because it's all about emotion or about hands, but uh, in, in many respects, not about intelligence or purpose anyway. So if you want to know more, by the way, I on the website, this the two clips that I just showed you are actually part of this, what I call the skills part, which then is a heart principles, holistic, energizing, activating, reflecting, and triangulation. I use now the E of energize, so that's the, the flow and the T of triangulate, but there is more to be said than, than that's a clip of, uh, say, also half an hour. Getting to the final part of my statement, and I still have 10 minutes, if you don't mind, Sandra, I think I'm still on, on, on time and on topic. Uh, so how to deal with it? And I can tell you, this is not easy. This has been a struggle over the last 25 years. In the last year, I became a emeritus professor uh, in a way that was a bit of a pity because I cannot sort of ask my, uh, uh, my staff to do a number of things for me. Uh, but actually, I'm also liberated from grading and having to do things for my staff in a way. So in a way, the emeritus state I'm looking Full of envy with to Sandra's position also, for instance, it's nice to to have a, a loose uh, sort of link with the university. However, I think 
that we need to develop this, and I have developed that, and I will share some of the experience that I had with sort of three interconnected challenges. Institutional, how to enhance the relevant of the universities link with the SDGs and what to focus on. Research, how to create the scientific foundations for this. And of course, I, I developed this book also on, on creating the scientific foundations. In teaching, well, basically, uh, even with bachelor students in the first year uh, business class, say how to stimulate students to deal with complexity, but still stay motivated. So that's what we developed. And I can give you examples and I will give you, share you some examples of this. But most of these examples then, and I've been have time to reflect about what are the sort of components of these, uh, call it alignment entries. Uh, it has to be challenge based. So from an institutional point of view, what are the societal challenges that universities or institutions are looking at? What are the organizational principles to embrace? How to frame this? Then if you frame it, how to navigate as is the flow thing, change, how to measure and leverage change. How can you make sure that the people want to make that change? So this is a leadership question that requires empowerment of participants, some self-management uh, uh, skills and the like. And of course, what is the value proposition or the motto? So for instance, my university adopted the motto, we are a force for positive change, then linked up to the SDG agenda. And that created a lot of energy, but also a lot of misunderstanding because we made the wrong decision to say we are a force for positive change. So that also means nobody is incentivized anymore to do something because we, of course we are not. We want to be a force for positive change. So if you link it to the research, it's about grand challenges, wicked problems. And of course, Sandra, we talk about wicked problems, grand challenges all the time. So what, what does it mean in terms of the principles? This is the SDG principles, people, planet, prosperity, peace, partnering. If you look at framing, what are corporate actions? Then navigating changes, overcoming intention, realization gaps. With By the way, all these elements have been elaborated also on the website. You cannot just do a case but you have to contextualize it in order to understand where you are. And this is where you see the sustainable development goals and in particular SD4 on education becomes very material. When you do teaching, you have to take the challenge of our students uh, series. I call it Gen Z challenges. And that then relates to this 21st century skills, lifelong learning, all sorts of personal action, leadership, change, collaborative mindset, and something that you might have heard about, but this is what we call the inner development goals. So let me share the last, say, six minutes of my of my presentation with what we did. So, for instance, when we adopted the SDGs, we also adopted the prime responsible management education uh, principles. There are seven of them. I will not deal with them in detail. We also try to engage staff. So we use this, and you are a force, and we ask them, fill out the form, add your name in the middle, and say, what are the challenges that are closest to your heart? Which ones do you have to impact or can you impact, et cetera? Just as a, a brainstorming session. And we did it, uh, at least the, the leader of, of the, the, the positive change uh, project, then engaged in every department and department then organized around this. And then, for instance, these are just two of these, uh, of these forms. Eva Roth is the director of the positive change uh, 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 project. And this is me. You can see uh, I'm, I'm engaging in almost every, everyone, but also with the partnership resource center that, that, that Sandra referred to, but also many, many other uh, action-oriented uh, research and teaching activities. So we initiate action as SDG ambassadors. So we asked students, what is the SDG that you're passionate about? And do you want to do something? So they engage in a closing swap or donation day or whatever. We try to create an inspirational environment where we can see we have an I will campaign introduced by George Yip, by the way. He was then Dean. So I will have a positive influence the world. If you go to the website of the I will campaign, you can see now more than 10,000 I will statements with a nice picture. And of all the business students that were that were involved in that campaign, I think only 1% said something that you would consider to be typical business. I want to earn a maximize profits. I want to create the most efficient value chain, or I want to squeeze out the profits of my suppliers or whatever. Of course, nobody does that. Everybody talks about positive, about I uh, want to, uh, to, to solve some societal issues. 
We even planted a tree with the Dalai Lama. You can see it here. We even put a, a sign there. And now you can see the solution that I invented together with the, the team of the Dalai Lama to deal with the paradox. So the paradox of heart, head, and hands is how to combine a warm heart, a cool head, and productive hands. Well, this is the statement, how to use the warmth of their heart to keep their heads cool and their hands productive, which of course is a paradox. It's a physical impossibility, but it's, it is something that was extremely inspiring for, for me to work on. The tree now is there 10 years. It's not really doing very well, by the way, but that's because of construction activities. Go to the campus and you might see it. So we use the framework to inspire people. These are important people, the prime minister, the dean, director, business leaders, uh, political leaders, scientists, you see Dan Ariely there, for instance, uh, 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 one of my favorite uh, uh, psychologists. And of course, we made it personal. I would search collaborator solutions for wicked problems. I wouldn't have made that poster now, by the way, because I'm not that much into solution, but collaborative approaches, because I think that's, that's better. Nevertheless, I still like it. So we then started in, of course, what you do as an academic, you say, okay, how to make it uh, researchable. So that's a little booklet I wrote in, in 2018 on the sustainable development goals, do poster sessions and the like, and then the big book came out of this. That was a continuous learning activity for me also with students and they made posters and they, they present that. You can see it on the website also what that means. We also made it personal by developing MOOCs. So you can go into to the MOOC open access to share it and sharing is not only sort of a, an act of, uh, how do you call that, uh, philanthropy, but actually is an ad, act of engagement. So we won, we became the, the best MOOC award in 2019 by the SDG Academy. Of course, that, that really improved also the position of the, the leader of the program. The hummingbird, by the way, stands for the idea that even a hummingbird, a small uh, 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 bird, can make a difference, which is based on the famous African uh, um, uh, anecdote. And we then use uh, poster competitions. So, and maybe at the end of the session, if you still have time, we now introduce even the Academy of International Business has applied this poster competition formula now to a global competition on posters on making business also part of a force for positive change. Uh, we create innovative tools, labs, the better business can, you go to the website, you see also that the book is only one, one result of, a, of, an, of an alignment between education, research, and teaching, which on the one hand is aimed at empowering students, but I can tell you after all this time, it empowers me as well. And you can easily imagine that a more di a different educational formula in an institute, of course, that has to go for top publications and is efficiency driven is not always easy, but th that fight was worth its while. By the way, my offer then to all of you, if you like it, there are all sorts of customized approaches that we're now developing together with other universities from Trinity College to uh, SBTM in Jakarta. Uh, feel free to contact me and, and go to the website because I'm really committed to this, it, in, not in the least because it energizes me. Uh, let, let's, a few, few more minutes, if you don't mind, Sandra, to engage in the most, the most sort of challenging uh, uh, a challenge that I faced over the last couple of years that engaging engaging Gen Z. Uh, and Gen Z, I acknowledge that the certain, I try to convince them that they have to go for climate change and poverty and whatever, and they do. But they also have their own challenges. And their challenges range from the housing crisis, debt crisis, they're considered to be snowflakes, their, their parents have more opportunities than they have. Of course, this is generalizing, but there are students with obesity challenges, with, with loneliness, with stress, fake news, etc. So this is the first step. Take them seriously. But also, that makes for me easier than to say, well, most of these challenges are wicked, are complex. You cannot just solve them. So that makes it then possible to introduce these skills and then say, well, if you really want to do it, you have to develop something what I call principle-based skill development. So these are just some slides from this uh, skill sheet book where we say, okay, if you want to do good research, there are a number of principles. And the, one of the principles is build upon the research of others. 
my students are amazingly afraid of plagiarism, for instance. And I say to them, please plagiarize, but of course, reveal the sources. And then hopefully, if you add 10% of your own ideas to existing knowledge, that, that is great. Make motivated choices, open up, be critical, dare to fail, share failing. Lifelong learning. So I learned them not to have 100 different ways to, to read a book or whatever, which is also part of the skill sheet, but to apply principles. So dare to fail, create a sense of completion, assume responsibility for your own learning. These are very basic things. Of course, we discuss that. So we're not sort of doing this uh, and I, I give it to them and then there's an exam. This is something that you discuss in class. Then it becomes active reading. Reading is not is one of the most important skills you have, but also one of the most empowering skills you have. You cannot read or find the sources of what you what you read and, and rely on something. But actually, reading is also active. So you have to use a book. It's much better to read than an ebook, for instance. Constructive listening actually is this is the worst part of this uh, this online uh, webinars. Constructive listening is really something that you need if you present also where the audience that is engaged. And we could know, go on, because it's about powerful writing, it's about effective presentation, and it's about effective team management. These are the seven skills that what you might call the foundational skills, but also have foundational principles. And I, I don't have time to, to deal with them all, but I, I hope you get the message. The message is, if you, for instance, accept that you want to take responsibility for your own learning, my students, and then you make a challenge based on the basis of what they what, what they what they also feel really passionate about, then you do a something like this, and I will I will campaign. Um, I will educate the world, and you even go from an I will to we will statements, and I do that in my in my own classes, and then they work on that. We will use our empathy and drive to create a better world for everyone, uh, and nobody in that sort of common challenge-based, principle-based educational environment says, well, uh, uh, we only go for the grade or we only go, of course they want to have high grades, by the way, but they also go for their passion and they can, and they write, uh, by the way, uh, um, uh, sustainable leadership pro, uh, reports. Oh yeah, you can see it here, for instance, they refer to in the development goals and, and I combine these two books and formulas and you have buddy groups, and poster presentations, and everybody likes it. And I don't give them feedback forms. I always give them feed forward forms. And I ask the students to do it themselves so that they know how difficult it is also, not only to grade, I don't ask them to grade, but to give feed forward conversation. That means you do it. We do it, by the way, now in the whole province of South Holland, where uh, the Hague is, uh, uh, but also Rotterdam and, and big cities, but also big companies. Major problems we have in terms also of e ecological devastation, the biodiversity, economic growth. And we do together with, with 20, 30 stakeholders in the province and with students from different universities. So this is how it looks. We create traineeships. We do an SDG professional, basically saying, if you want to do, we give you the SDG challenge. And this is the final slide that in any case, I would like to share with you. Now we move from a university, from a, a province. And of course we are global. I, I teach all around the world. Luckily, this is the AIB that said, well, this poster competition is something, why don't we adopt it? So if you're interested, I can send you the information. I think I sent the information to one of you already. Uh, it starts already now. And it also means that we can share information with each other we do a little competition, of course, with some awards, but the basic story is, of course, like the Olympic Games, uh, uh, joining and participating is more important than winning. But of course, we all want to win. So thanks. I sorry, seven minutes too long. I hope it, you don't you you uh, absolve me from this uh, serious over uh, overturn of time. Okay. I think we can forgive you, Rob. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, so we have a whole bunch of questions, but I have a couple that uh, occurred to me. Well, one of the first ones, are the skill sheets available in English? I guess the- Yes, they are. They are in English, yes. Okay. Maybe well, if you- get... I, I have to tell you one thing. Pearson, I, Pearson is the biggest educational publisher in, in the 
in the world, they have difficulties in share in, in distributing the thing. So go to the website and if you want, I can I uh, link up with me and I will make sure that you get a, a copy. Great. Hopefully. Okay, and I just uh, there's a ton of questions, but I want to ask you about <laughs> the um the flip chart behind you. <laughs> ah. And if you could just share your thoughts about that, why it's there and what it means. Well, very simple. I and explain I it to people. As I do a lot of I, research on the sustainable development goals. So it, within that, people say 70 goals, 169 targets, 230 indicators, too much, or sometimes even too few. I say, well, we have to prioritize. So, so my priority is with SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. There's a lot of confusion, by the way, on that, because the story and the theory of change, and I write about that. If you like it, I can send you the papers. Basically said decent work linked to living wage. I'm the chair of the Living Wage Foundation, by the way. Uh, creating open access data for the world to share with each other and then to create a sort of level playing field on which we then say living wage, living income. On the basis of that, then we organize decent work. And on the basis of that, we know that there is a positive relationship then with relevant, inclusive, sustainable economic growth. Of course, the economic growth is a highly debated stuff, of course, in developed countries where you say degrowth. But of course, in Zimbabwe, growth is 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 still relevant. So I hope you understand. So that's why the exclamation mark is big because the data, we have what we call a data dividend. I work with the UN on this. The data dividend on a global scale is immense, but we have to implement it at the company level and we have to translate it. So that's the explanation of that poster. Great, thank you. I, I have more questions, but I'll, I'll let, let's see <laughs> if we can get time to get back to mine. Um, Roland, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, I, I was. Uh, I hopefully wasn't distracted. When, when uh, I will, more often than not, is not about what we saw the business principle. Uh, would this have to do with the Dutch uh, environment, where we have consensus? And I remember Philip Tiergebaan's nice book, The Logic of Anna where it says the Americans are about contract, the French are about honor in the labor contract, mm. uh, and the Dutch and the Germans are about consensus. So if, yeah. you ask, if you ask people from this environment, you get these answers. Or was it international? So I it's, hope it's it was. Completely, it's completely international, Roland. There is no alternative. I'm, uh, as Sandra also said, I'm one of these uh, thinkers behind the collaborative advantage, uh, uh, lifetime work also in collaboration in all countries in the world where the SDGs are just one other sign of what we call collective vision-based negotiation. We know what we want to achieve. There's no reason why we would not eradicate poverty, why we would not have climate action, why we would not, but we have to define how to do that and that requires collaboration. Nobody, even the biggest companies, the biggest countries can do it on their own. So it's an intellectual challenge, but in order to make that work, we have 100,000 different ways to approach it, which actually is nice because then can be entrepreneurial spirit, but you have to identify it also in terms of what it is. It had nothing to do with the Dutch example. Actually, Dutch are way off track in creating collaborative solutions because we are not really doing well in that area. Uh, well, well, remember when I was in business, the toughest negotiators were my Dutch colleagues. So oh yeah, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> and it's, all about, it's all about money, by the way. Sandra, can you can okay. you? Because I haven't seen all the chat messages. Could yeah, you no, I, I, I'll, make I'll... a selection of that because I would love to answer all of them. I see some of them, but maybe you can make a selection of this. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Joanna, um, do you want to ask more about the uh, the IDGs? Joanna, still here? I am still here. I can never find the unmute. Hi, Sandra. Uh, hi. Um, hi, hi, Joanna. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> hi, Rob. Um, it was great to see how many of us immediately connected, I think, with the relationship between your work and the inner development goals. So it, it might be good to maybe take a minute and and maybe speak about how you use them in the classroom. Mm. Um, and and while we're all on here, I'll put in a plug. There's a new book coming out on the inner development goals that oh. the um, Basel maybe, Impact and, and maybe a word or two about what they are for anybody oh, yeah. who's not familiar. Yeah. Um, well, uh, they came out of a lot of work that was done in Sweden, um, uh, in Stockholm, and now connected all over the world. 
Um, but the idea that in order to achieve the sustainable development goals, we also need all sorts of inner qualities um, that maybe are sometimes captured under self-efficacy, um, but include things um, about our own interchange that we might want to work on that would make us better able to collaborate. So connected somewhat with Otto Scharmer's work, um, with Immunities to Change, yeah. uh, Kenan Leahy, and a number of other sort of ideas that have been working on on adjacent. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Rob, you no, want to respond? Yes, no. Uh, I showed you very fast in some of the slides what I call the Sustainable Leadership Profiler, where that I help people. You can download it, by the way. It's clickable. You can even use it in class. I saw some people also asking how you can integrate that in class. I would be happy also to give you more extensive answers to some of these questions. If you send them to me, my email number uh, is artulder uh, at rsm.nl. But anyway, I will share that with you. Uh, but the uh, we made a, a profiler where we integrate then the inner development goals, but also the other goals in all sorts of assessments of where you are in your motivation, in your skills, et cetera. So that's one. In the development goals uh, are still work in progress. They, they for instance, assess, they, they say integrity or creativity or honesty, uh, a courage, those sort of inner qualities that are relevant. Now, one of my problems is that the inner development goals have not been really linked to one, uh, an educational theory, and secondly, to the SDGs itself. So they look interesting, but they're not. Actually, I just said, well, I don't mind because I make that link. So I can make that link and you can see, and I put that also in that, that little uh, document, uh, Sustainable Leadership, where I then link up the inner development goals with skills and the sustainable development goals. But it's just one way of engaging in the conversation. I always see, see this not as competition, but actually as complementary. And we navigate this for the same the same goals. But the inner development goals are now sort of a sort of a, yeah, a repertoire of all sorts of laudable goals, uh, but nevertheless, we already knew that to a certain extent. So the link with the SDGs is still relatively weak, but I like them still anyway. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions here and just ask. Um, Naveen asks about uh, SQ. Is it also ah. a is also associated with spiritual quotient. And mm. uh, Tracy Chang asks about Howard's ninth intelligence, existential intelligence. I think they may be linked. Wow. Well, of course, it, it's a bit playing on, on, on intelligence. And, and there, is, there are many, many other types of intelligence that we look at. But yes, spiritual intelligence, I try to get away from this, not necessarily because um, I, I don't think it is a relevant frame. But for me, Spirit intelligence very much relate to your emotion and also your pull of the heart. And the, and the heart for me is a more emotional intelligence. But that so in that corner the SQ for me is societal intelligence because it, it's in the real world, and it's about real challenges. Uh, I mean real. Eh? Of course, I, I know the, the audience here. What is real? Uh, but uh, about poverty, about climate, about uh, uh, the things that we also define within the, the frameworks of our main challenges. Spiritual intelligence is more like a means to that end. So I would port a position in the corner of emotional intelligence, but nevertheless, there are so many other developments. So I, I listed in a document, the philosophy document on this, a lot of these intelligence uh, dimensions, including spiritual intelligence, and I say basically, they are all relevant, but spiritual intelligence for me is about your emotion and your 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 passion, and that of course can relate even to religion, but it certainly can also relate to how you are motivated, uh, and that's what I call intrinsic motivation. So that relates also to the the motivational theory that I apply in many other research, and then look at intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is clearly related to spiritual. Extrinsic motivation very often is about challenges, societal challenges, but we know that we can never solve also on any way extrinsic or external, even existential problems to a face of, in the face of death or crisis. We know from motivational research that people very often deny or freeze or flight. Uh, so if you're really motivated to do something about it, it has to come from your intrinsic motivation. 
that can be spiritual, but that can also be what I do with, with companies. And with, by the way, which might be also one reason to link it to business schools is uh, that you see an opportunity. And the opportunity is not that you earn a lot of money, but that you can actually serve a societal goal or, or a need. And of course, if you're a business, you need to base that on a, on a business model that has sustainable finance. But there's nothing wrong with that in a capitalist society. Uh, if you don't want to do, of course, become autonomous and uh, uh, sort of get isolated from the rest of the world. So w it, linking up to the motivational literature that we also developed, I wrote a whole book on getting all the motives right. I think the distinction between intrinsic, extrinsic motivation and mixed motives, and then the game theory that's related to that can help you a lot also to think about uh, spiritual uh, intelligence and the and, and the the other uh, uh, the more what was it the business Existential. question yeah oh. I, I forgot about the, the the exact framing of the other uh, intelligence um, spiritual spiritual and existential no no spiritual was the one and the other one uh, existential existential yeah well so I used the word yeah yeah. Um, now, Vin, do you want to ask your AI question? Are you still here? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm Jan here. Thanks, Rob. Um, hi, Naveen. So, yeah, hi, hi, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your response. Um, so now, you know, everything is connected with the AI, uh, AI and consciousness and the AI and everything else in this world. Yeah. So is there any connection that being already built? Uh, any theory is being, you know? Well, yeah, established with AI. You mean AI, uh, artificial intelligence? Yeah. Just to be sure, we, we use. Well, this is of course a question in teaching that everybody asks. Uh, what about Jet Jet GPT? What about uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, actually, I link that to what I call the data gap, because we face a number of data gaps in the world where there are substantial. On the other hand, we also have lots of data available, and so. 10 years ago, I dealt with that question, even without talking about AI. Then we talked about how we can deal with uh, info, info basitas, so big chunks of information with the internet and whatever. Now, of course, we are better able to, to jump it all together and then to get a lot of data, a lot of, a lot of ideas, and even have your paper written for you or whatever. So within that, then our number of what I call the principles of learning. So if you learn, you see these seven principles, you can see there's a lot of uh, uh, awareness of what, what are the sources, how reliable are they, then what is the question that I ask? Now, for instance, it, to take that one point, I don't, I don't mind chat GPT with my students as long as they reveal that they do that, that they are aware that it is a flawed technology, that technique, and, and it can really uh, 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 create all sorts of confusion. But the most important part of that skill using AI prudently is actually asking the right questions and then following up on the questions, then following up on the sources. Well, actually, these are the, the fundamental questions that I think every student, every uh, uh, sort of yeah, uh, uh, conscious participant in a societal discussion should know and should ask. Now, if you cannot rely on the information or the the paper that you that you you constructed by AI, the Chat GPT, or AI more in big data, getting together and all and creating all sort of uh, all sort of uh, correlations. That um, well, if you only look at that and uh, data driven, say well we have the correlation, so it is right, then you are wrong. Because but if you think hey I'm looking for correlation, I'm looking for in and then I use big data, or I want to make a good argument, I use AI, a Chat GPT on the right questions. And maybe if I get an answer that, uh, that I need to develop it further. That, by the way, why the, the poster competition is also adopted by many of my colleagues that are dealing with AI, because the poster cannot be done by an AI machine yet. And the argumentation yeah. behind <laughs> the sources is also impossible to copy yet. Of course, yeah. it, that will be developed further. But you can see struggling with AI doesn't mean we have to forbid it because it will be done anyway. And I think there can be a qualitative uh, uh, improvement also if we learn our students and ourselves, by the way, to use it prudently. So there's a, a number of really interesting questions here. Michael, you want to ask your question about five minutes? 
you hear michael uh, yeah i just um there's so many interesting things i uh, thank you for this conversation but what if you bring it down you have five minutes in a classroom and you have maybe a thousand students or something what would you what would you say what would you do with that time i want to know what they what they think the biggest challenge is at the moment and then we talk and then we don't talk about uh solving it but how to approach it and then i will guide them because that's the maybe you saw that in the six entries it's challenge based principle based but also navigating so you cannot learn if you don't want to navigate so uh, I will never give answers to any question anymore. Uh, I did it all the time, by the way, because I'm an expert and I'm very proud of the 150 scientific articles I wrote and the 25 books and whatever. Uh, I, maybe I can tell that to you that I'm proud of that, but I certainly will never tell it to my students because they need to be never supported and not impressed. By the way, experts are very often have it wrong. And you know, you know the uh, Hans Rosling uh, test, the chimpanzee test, the chimpanzee has it uh, often at a better idea on what the trends are than experts. So we have to be very humble. So is that a five, a five minute approach? It's, so it's more approach yeah. than anything else. But yeah. I, I think I hope then to inspire my students and everybody else, including you all, not to stick to the one hour or the five minutes or the 10 minutes or whatever, but hopefully to to link up to the themes that uh, I introduced and the the philosophy that I introduced and to 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 do to, to continue on that. By the way, again, uh, Sandra, I offer this of course to anyone. Please ask me the questions, or if I didn't give it enough answer, I'm fully aware and av available to uh, link up with you by mail. Thank you. We have like three minutes left. I'm going to combine two other there are big questions. One, one is, can you, Sheldon asked, can you say more about feed forward as opposed to feedback? Ah. And Ju Young asked, um, how can business schools change? This is a big one. How can business schools change from a traditional model to a heart model? Yes. So you have, uh, well, you have two minutes, basically. Yes. To those questions. Uh, the, the first one is feed forward is, is really important because, and this you can see also in the skill sheets on Giving and getting feedback is one of the most important techniques that people can learn. And you have to learn it because there are some rules to this. For instance, if you give feedback, there is a rule. There is some, some uh, in the sandwich formula, whatever. If you receive feedback, there's a rule to that as well. If both of the people that do that don't understand the rules of the engagement, like internet etiquette, for instance, you are engaging in a completely wrong conversation. So that, that's where the feedback and feed forward frame comes into play. And there are skill sheets by that, by that. By the way, if you want to know more, I, I will send you the stuff. The second one, well, actually, I, I walk the talk because I walked the talk in my own institute, the Rotten School of Management, and we changed a lot. But uh, I, I was very lucky to be now 25 years full professor, which gave me some status. But now it's, it's all about being smart also in the institute because you will not change the institute on an institutional level, top down. You have to do it bottom up, certainly in the present era of, uh, of what to say, uh, I don't know, great orientation, control orientation, uh, one year masters where you only go for for the uh, the, the, the cum laude, the grades or whatever. Um, no, you have to understand that students have to be taught to fail. You can fail. You have to be humble. And and one way, and that's the collaborative research Sandra and I are doing. Get together with your colleagues, organize a, a buddy group, uh, even within teachers and whatever. And hopefully, this is what I do now at the moment. I'm traveling around the world, by the way. And if you're really interested, I come to your university, uh, at least uh, if, if feasible, or we talk about that. And you can see you can slowly change the curriculum within the premises of the organization. But I have to tell you, I was a front runner also in my own institute. And in a way, it still is a front runner as an institute. But for instance, my predicament has been that everybody that says, well, uh, if we go for sustainability, well, then go to Rob because he's our sustainability professor. And then everybody had an excuse not to do anything. Now, we are smarter than that. And I have been smarter than that. So you can see that also in my presentation. We achieved some, uh, quite something, but we're still not there. It's a continuous change process. If you're aware of that and and prepared to do that because it's also highly rewarding 
also from a spiritual point of view, then we are on the on the right track. Thank you. I just want to thank everybody for attending. Um, thank you for um, Erica, Michael, and Ariane in the background helping out. And um, and particular particular thanks to Rob. There's incredible feedback in there in the chat saying what a wonderful session this was, Rob. Is, is, there, any, is there any possibility to get the feedback or to get the questions still? Uh, uh, yeah, Ariane, can you change? Yes. The, can you save the chat? Yes. Yes, I don't. I don't seem to be able to do it from here. So. Yes, so um, I'll also extend much gratitude to Sandra, to Rob, to everyone here today. The chat will be available. The recording will be available. Rob, as long as you're happy to share the slides, they will be available. Um, I don't think anyone would be here if this wasn't centrally important to each of us. So, yes. uh, if this is, you know, if this is passion as I believe it is for all of us stay in touch, stay involved in this community. We'll do more and more and more of this. Um, again, Rob and Sandra, thank you very, very much. Yeah, okay, thanks, cool. Erica. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Rob. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good luck.